Um, I don't know if the, my chairs managed to get any comments from people, but if you had anything that comes to your mind, I had a few people coming to talk to me. Um, and one thing that Ian passed on, um, for example, um, and I'm not sure if Karen had a big enough lunch to be able to answer because she, she <laughs> very unfairly represents all kinds of funders in this room. Um, I think there was a valid question, and Yanis mentioned also funding. This all sounds great, doing more evaluation, doing more co-design, co-curation, combining qualitative and quantitative. It was mentioned time and time again the last few days. But funders, and it was a joke about the HLF, I do mean much more broadly all kinds of different funders, they still seem to stick to mainly quantitative, sometimes exclusively quantity, quantitative indicators. And how do we combine the two? Well, to be fair to Karen yesterday, she com she had qualitative indicators, and the study she cited used qualitative indicators. That's but the HLF, though. Right. Do you feel that all kinds of funders do that? I think it comes down to the KPIs that you actually define for the project. If you define the KPIs that combine both qualitative and quantitative, and it came out in your workshop in uh, was last March, how important those the combination of the two really were. I think that funders are looking for a model that they can say is has some validity and some standing in in the scientific literature. And if you're if you use for, to analyze, if you say I have a qualitative some qualitative data that I'm going to analyze, and here's the statistical methods I'm going to utilize to do that, um, and I have some qualitative data and I'm just going to look at it, then they're going to say no. But if you say, I'm going to use Flucodian or fair clause methods for analyzing the, the uh, qualitative data, it adds a lot of credibility to what you're doing with it. So. Do you have a comment? Do you want to say something more? Yeah, uh, uh, just to follow up on that, and obviously Karen and I have, have talked about this a lot, and Karen has heard me, me rant on this, uh, this topic more than, more than she <laughs> more than she'd like, I think. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, following up on Seamus's point about the KPIs, I mean, you can't evaluate impact if you didn't design it into the product in the first place. And we always look at evaluation from the wrong end of the telescope. We look at it from the, at the, the summative point. We look at it at the end of a project. And the studies that I've done on impact evaluation and in cultural heritage, one of which Milena cited um, in her presentation, a collaborative project we worked on, the conclusion of that was very much that we're looking for impact in the wrong place. We should be looking for it at the outset and designing resources around that and building it into the design of the project, whether that's participatory design or whether that's a top-down design, but one way or the other, it has to be factored in at the outset. Um, yeah, I'll just build on that to say that I think uh, often it's part of those funding obligations that one needs to specify what it is you're going to build and therefore set some KPIs, etc. And with it a bit more um, uh, acceptance that there is ambiguity, inherent ambiguity in any digital development, um, that we need to, yes, bring forward ev evaluation and understanding what that evaluation might look like earlier in the process. However, also leaving enough room for things to change and not being bound by KPIs that are no longer relevant, even s months or you know sometimes weeks further down the project. So um, yes, being able to deal with ambiguity, I think, is something that's crucial in any digital product, but especially one that needs to comply and conform to funding obligations. I think following Seamus's point, it's important for all of us collectively to to shape and help funders and funding bodies as well to change things more in that direction by being rigorous, by opening and sharing things. But I was wondering, as several of you in the room probably had in some form or other to write a report, A, initially proposal to get the money, and B, to kind of afterwards uh, reporting on what was achieved and the impact. Did you, do you have any models, successful or unsuccessful, just any experience of when you were actually compiling all the statistics that you managed somehow to bring somehow the qualitative element in any way that was useful?
Milena, I don't know, did you have any example from um, work you've done in Malta with the other projects? Did you find any way in specific? Or Yanni, I don't know, in your, your experience as well, where you try to squeeze in some qualitative things as well? Can I uh, give an anecdotal example? Uh, some years ago, the European Commission had a call for uh, proposals uh, for digitization of masterpieces of European culture. So the proposals obviously had to explain why what they propose I is falling under this category of masterpieces. This is obviously related to impact. It was something very specific which was uh, targeted and then it was interesting to see how people would justify this. Um, I recall a proposal on German uh, newspapers from 19th century uh, without obviously saying that they're not important. How would you justify that they're masterpieces? I mean, they're interesting. The material there is uh, relevant to large groups of people doing different type of research. But uh, quite often we start from the point that, uh, and Yanis uh, covered this in his talk, sometimes we speak different languages. We need to speak the same language. We need to see the same thing as someone else is seeing. And obviously in this run for project funding, everyone would go present something and would claim this is a masterpiece. It's important for someone. But <laughs> that's not always the case. Kirsty, I don't know from the from the, um, I was wondering Kirsty Linkstad is at the Historic Environment Scotland, and because they've done and were presented at our one of our last workshops, their crowdsourced projects. Um, I was wondering whether any of the research about them, whether in house or from people outside looking at them, whether you found any qualitative measurements about the use of the archives that uh, was useful in any way or the lack of. I mean, mainly it's more anecdotal. Um, so you get kind of anecdotal feedback um, that you can kind of sort of add in and get kind of statements and comments on this was really useful, that was less useful, I enjoyed engaging with this. So they tend to be more those kind of comments which you can feed in with the numbers, um, but they're hard to, they tend to be quite project specific and they're hard to compare over time. Um, and they can kind of vary as well in, in terms of their their quality as well. So it's hard to pull that together. And then you're into the looking at more kind of qualitative user focus groups in order to get something back. And you can only do that with a really large project where you've maybe got additional funding or HLF funded. So it it's quite varied as to what you get. The it will be time for the microphone to go to Karen, but I think you've seen a lot of projects and I'm sure some of them manage to do some of those measurements better than others. So I was wondering if there were any tips or anything you, you were impressed by that would be useful you can share. Thank you. Um, I'll have a go at that in a sec. But what I was going to suggest was that there is a third M to go with Gianni's myths and monsters, if I may, which I think is mystique. And I think what's going on here is that there is a mystique about digital, that it is somehow different, special, separate, and yes, it has its own issues, but actually what you're all really talking about is the difficulty of evaluating anything that you do. If, as Lorna said, you don't start at the beginning knowing exactly what you're seeking to do, if you don't start with an idea, and, and, and you do deal with ambiguity, but if you don't start with any of that, and if you don't start with thinking, what data will I collect? When will I collect it? How will I collect it? What will I use it for during the project? I think those are the kind of fundamental. There may be specific things about, and I'm sure there are, about trying to collect that data in the settings in which people are using digital, be it online. And I, I learned loads, I've learned absolutely loads during the last two days that I would like to share with everyone who does an HLF project because I think people are just, that they're scared and they see this mystique about it and they, they panic and actually we could do a lot to calm that down and, and share the practice. Um, but at the same time, I think it's interesting what, what Kirsty just said about users' comments. Um, 
we as a funder have to make a case to people. It doesn't, it doesn't stop <laughs> with us. It isn't easy being a funder. We still make an impact case. And um, a lot of the qualitative data we might put forward from um, aggregated from all of the projects we fund or created by our programme evaluation, in which we invest a lot of money looking at, at similar projects across programmes. A lot of that qualitative data, when you present it to other people, and often to government stakeholders, for example, becomes anecdotal feedback. It's not valued. It's not seen as actually the evidence that demonstrates a changed life, that demonstrates somebody growing in confidence and moving on from being a volunteer to being a member of staff. Or somebody who says, I didn't go out of the house for several months until I joined that group in the museum or somebody took me to it. it, it it's not valued sufficiently, but, and we're not very good at making that case collectively. I think the, the culture sector is much weaker um, than, than some other sectors. But I think if um, everyone who's in the room and who has experience tried to apply that general learning, and we've had some fantastic general learning today. We've had general learning about co-design. We've had general learning about using resources, what researchers are seeking for. If we tried to apply that to some of the common types of digital that we create, it's not gonna fit everybody, one size doesn't. But I do think there's something we could distill out of it. And I hope that is slightly helpful. I think it was enormously helpful. We, I'm, I'm sorry, we lost the third microphone, so you have to <laughs> wait a little bit. There were, I think, three comments. From S sometimes from these uh, qualitative uh, exercises we do, uh, we arrive to very interesting uh, formulations, which actually could be used even in branding. I, I just wanted to give one example which came out of one of the focus groups we were running back in uh, 2010, and this was uh, about Europeana. Uh, one participant said that if Europeana uh, was to become a cultural Google, um, then this would uh, really change how people are seeing it. This, this, I don't think that this ever happened or this phrase caught the eye of people who, um, who brand Europeana, but actually that summarizes very well what, uh, what could be its ambition. Um, so I just wanted to say that yes, in qualitative um, feedback, there is a lot of repetitiveness, obviously a lot of sub subjectivity, but sometimes you have such real gems which uh, come and can be very helpful to, to develop a different view on what uh, one is doing. It's a different stage of, or a different perception. I don't remember exactly um, whose quote is this, but I recall, uh, you know, there's this mixed methods uh, approach which means that we uh, pour in uh, qualitative and quantitative measures and do some uh, studies. Uh, so there were a lot of people praising, you know, mixed uh, methods approach, but uh, there was uh, one researcher, I don't recall his name, who said, okay, we tend to um, add qualitative uh, analysis when uh, we don't have, you know, the results we want and we want to round the corners. And this is not very easy. Uh, in our case, I recall uh, after you know the first uh, round of comments, I recall uh, a, a national project, uh, a actually a small project about a museum that we had, and it didn't had actually you know this kind of uh, statistics that you could show. I mean, it was a small museum in an Ionian Islands. Um, the visitors are very uh, few, therefore you cannot claim, you know, for big data and big numbers and big figures. Therefore, we had, uh, we did uh, some usability test because we had an application long before applications uh, where we had, we are using PDAs, if anyone remembers how a PDA was, personal digital assistant. Um, we didn't have, you know, smartphones and uh, things like that, so we were using PDAs and uh, all of a sudden the usability study of a PDA, if you have used a PDA, you know, it is a pain. Um, it was a pain. Uh, all of a sudden the usability study showed uh, remarkable scores of efficient and easy to use, uh, you know, uh, experience. Uh, 
it's not very flattering to say, but I have to say it because I, I just as I did, you know, uh, some uh, judgment on uh, others' work, I want to be, you know, honest to you for our work. Therefore, you know, the qualitative study uh, rounded the corners for our uh, project. It was a national uh, project. Probably nobody paid attention. It's just bureaucracy after, you know, the end of the, the, the project to end it. Uh, but that was the spirit, and I feel that the spirit is more or less, you know, around us. So I, I just um, picked up one thing that much of our discussion is focused on the summative evaluations that we do at the end of projects. And I think that there is a place, f as we heard in Katie Price's talk yesterday, for putting a, a lot of emphasis on the formative evaluations. And the one I th thing that I took away from the application of the Agile method, I, which, I, which I know from devel systems development, I thought it was wonderful to see it applied to the context of a museum. And their qualitative evaluations, I think you told us that five was a crucial number of... of uh, for, for, right. Yeah. And uh, that, that for me was, was, there's a lot of qualitative evaluation there. It shows you the power of it in formative stages, and I thought that was a, a very good thing. And the second point that I, I want to make about this is that we're also taught, when we talk about impact assessment, everybody seems to talk about near-term impact assessment, you know, very close to the end of the project. I don't hear much about what happens five years down the road. Um, and I think that, uh, that's where we really start to see, see impact. I, I was once sitting in a lecture with, uh, that given by Ted Nelson, who's the guy who invi invented hypertext and hypermedia. And there was a, a woman in the audience who was the, a senior person in the Rockefeller Foundation who at the end of the question, at the end of the lecture, asked a question and said, uh, you taught me 40 years ago, and the ideas that you gave me then helped to shape the way I work and think now. Now, that is the kind of impact that you really want to know your projects have. Now, I know we're not going to go back in 40 years, but I think five to seven years going back and looking at some of these projects and asking whether they were, were value, whether they actually change the way behaviors, change the way people thought, it is, was an important metric and measure. And I know it's hard for funders to see the, the, themselves to invest in that because we don't have good ways of selling whether that's valuable. But I think it, it might help us to understand the design of projects and so forth a little bit. Sorry, I was a little bit wrong. Will Kilbride is not, couldn't be here today. He was chairing yesterday from the Digital Preservation Coalition, so I have to clone for a second to be William and just raise the point. Very good about the long-term impact, I agree with Seamus, but also just mere existence of the digital and long-term preservation. It's so depressing. I think that 10% of European collections being digitized, I'm not sure how many of you were aware of that, even more depressing of quite high-profile, publicly funded, digitization projects 10 years later, I won't mention even longer than that, how many of them are still accessible online? So very, very few. So that's another element there as well about usability and also I'm um, just rem remembering of another point uh, from one of you that was passed on to me. Even the knowing the existence of this, even when we do it right and we do the co-design and we do the formative and we do the agile, all the other, and actually a lot of wonderful other methods, the co-curation, co-design, and the formative was, I think, throughout the two days mentioned by several of you, which was very nice to see. I, see, I think we are moving towards understanding and agreeing on that. Uh, but uh, despite all this hard work, how many of our end user communities don't even know that these things existed? Even within, you know, like Yanis mentioned, the enumerate, which is very close to a lot of our work and research, and we didn't know it, and it's very high profile and well funded let alone about digital resources, museums, libraries, and archives that we've spent so long, we think we've almost overdone it with our marketing and tweeting and Facebooking and doing presentations, and then you discover core parts of the audience don't even know it's up there. 
And how do you deal with that? Do we have to try to be more open and less in our professional or other kind of bubble to listen a little bit more and, and get on the other person's perspective and trying to understand how they find out about these things? How can we move, make, you know, sort this out? Because it's a real problem, I think, that several of you talked about. Um, I couldn't agree more. And I think discoverability for me felt like a, an important theme both within products and to allow access to those products and how we can work, um, find new ways to get the content we're producing into the hands of people, not creating new destinations, uh, but where we are for very valid reason creating new destinations, new products, thinking about how we build in um, things like search engine optimization and pay-per-click advertising, all those sorts of tactical measures that can help increase the, the chances of this content, this glorious content being discovered. I'm not sure how much those feature in funding applications because uh, you do need to put a, you know, quite a lot of oomph behind uh, any sort of digital visibility and uh, to, in, uh, to increase the chances of that discoverability. And I'm not sure how well equipped we all are um, at the uh, dark arts of search engine optimization to make sure that that happens. Can I just uh, follow up on that? Um, I mean, I, I have, um, I completely agree with this, and I, I would actually go further than than, uh, than my fellow panelists in this because I think Maria is absolutely right. There's lots and lots of digital cultural heritage resources that are no longer accessible. But I would make the argument that if things aren't sustained, then they've obviously had no impact. If they're allowed to disappear, they're not being used and there's no one is going to miss them. And in 2009, the AHRC did a study of projects it's fun it had funded through the Resource Enhancement Scheme, and it discovered that about half of them weren't available anymore after the mandated AHRC period of three years or something. But I think the reason for that was that half of them, half of the projects funded by the AHR AHRC made no attempt to understand user statistics. They didn't have any analytical tools built in. They did not bother to assess how users were interacting with those resources. And I think the, the usage impact and sustainability triangle is is absolutely essential to understand because those three things are directly interconnected. I think, Lorna, you're very right. It is that triangle. And I think one of the things we haven't tackled enough is that kind of digital sustainability and preservation. And we're quite interested in creating content and new applications and trying to disseminate. But we quite often forget in that also what is it our users are actually wanting and getting more understanding of what our users are wanting how they're going to use that, and then us getting over almost our fear around about digital preservation, how complex that can be when you're dealing with sort of applications that aren't just images or text and kind of beginning to crack that and deliver that so you do have longer term resources available. And I think they're real things we do need to start tackling over the next few years. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I think one of the things that, to some extent, we're missing um, is the linking. And I think that's, to some extent, the discoverability. So I think Google's done that by, by linking. And I think we need to do that a lot more. It's, a, it's something I don't think we do enough. Um, I, I'm from the Botanic Garden, so I'm a different kind of data set. But we're starting to make those links now, but I think once we make those links, that will help with the discoverability, and that will then help with the sustainability as well, I think, because pe people will start using it more. I just make one, might make one plea, that just because a resource is not used in, a, in the near term doesn't mean that it won't have long-term value. I remember many, many years ago, I, I actually did a study in around 1997 for the Heritage Lottery Fund about information technology. And one of the things that um, someone found for me was a nut survey from the Victorian period of to assess dormouse populations as evidence of environmental change. And that particular study was buried away somewhere, hadn't been looked at in almost 100 years, 
And what was important to actually redo, um, to look at change over time. And change over time, if you think about historians like Leroy Lottery, um, is really important to understand how we've come to be what we are. So just because we don't use some digital resource that we've created doesn't mean that it won't have value in the future. And I, I know it's a delicate balance, but uh, I think we have to think not just in a closed mind. We have to try to be broader and, and see that po those possibilities. Um, I wanted to, to ask a question, talking about linking, which was a very good comment, and all this trying to avoid doing what we criticize. <laughs> I mentioned the intention to do papers and thinking also of academics. We've all put on the app the gigantic abstracts, and, um, <laughs> together with some short ones. Tweeting has been going like crazy. We've recorded, and thanks so much for the colleagues who came here in this quite new facility that we I tested their limits with the live streaming and the recording and the lecture overflow. These are some of the things I thought to, to share this with the brother because there was interest from all over the world about this, which was really nice to see and the kind of the extent of this really quite surprised me. Do you have other ideas um, of what we should be doing um, so we collaborate more and we share more um, on what we've been talking the last few days and also I noticed um, some people um, in the word research. It was so nice to see Alison, for example, Webb talking from her own um, as a consultant and having a private room, working with cultural heritage institutions, using this, not just from academic and research institutions. And I noticed the hesitation when I was doing invitations or talking to some of you who are in mainstream cultural heritage institutions. That, uh, is this the place for me? It sounds like a conference. Will this be useful at the end of the day? I'm, I'm very conscious of the competing demands. People mention teachers in the research. Some of them are with us today. But there's all kinds of audience, audiences we all serve um, that don't have maybe the time or the luxury to read long academic papers. And, and um, I think it's very important for what we're doing to keep um, this communication between the different communities. Uh, because there are all kinds of communities, I think, we're bringing together doing work in this area. So I was wondering if there are things that we might have forgotten and kind of the network and the team, or any suggestions. I don't think, for example, we had the time, Twitter was a real challenge with the characters it has, but maybe the quick and snappy, the more applied to practice, I invited, we gave some, I don't know if you realize, some travel bursaries to four people who came, some of them gave papers, other people attended, master students, early career researchers, which I also thought was very important. It was so nice for me to see in the symposium the whole range, the hierarchical, as well as the breadth and the, the width of the different institutions covered. Um, and I asked them, cheekily, after giving them very little money for their travel, to be our communications fellows and maybe think not just of Twitter, that all of you did so well, but maybe blogs, maybe more reflective pieces. I think it was a real nice vibe and atmosphere the last few days, but maybe when you go away and the dust settles, like what can you take to your respective communities? What can you bring back? So I don't know if any of you had ideas. I noticed this awful, brilliant design skills in the room, all kinds of different in-depth knowledge, scientific, practical, project management, it's all kinds of things that we bring, uh, which was very nice to see, so. Have we covered everything? <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm a master's student and I study in classics. Um, I also have a background in business and behavioral economics. And something that I found in this talk was that Everything that has been talked about here, I've also seen in conferences for classics, behavioral economics, and the gaming industry. And so something I thought was very interesting was that I want to do digital humanities eventually, but I have no idea where to start. So I thought this would be a great conference to do that. But I think one way to collaborate more with all of these different disciplines like that I'm interested in is just to have something that says, OK, here's where you start, here are the basic pieces of writing, here are the basic websites to actually just look at and explore. It's a good idea and the challenge for us at Hattie, I think, Lorna. <laughs> it's a very good idea, thank you for that. <laughs> I, I have to say, it, when you go to a lot of, prod, a lot of conferences, 
you hear people talk about, uh, I, I remember when it was me and my word processor in the 80s, that tells you how long I've been around. And then it was me and my database where now we, we might get to the point where you go to evaluation projects and you hear about me and my evaluation. One of the great thing, strengths about the past two days for me um, was that I observed not people talking about me and my evaluation as an evaluation of some particular project alone. But I saw lots of people talking about underlying models. And I think one of the really interesting things that, and challenges that, that Maria will have when she pulls together all the papers for a volume would be to actually have an introductory section that talked about the different models that people use. I'm throwing out a challenge to you. But the, what did you the, the, <laughs> the, the, the different models that people talked about that using. And that, is, that addresses some of your question about what, where do you start from. There's a lot of other areas you have to start from, but this would, would be a help because there were some really, really good, good models that talked about from, from the work that, well, I turned for a moment to my own session with uh, Kevin Burden and Stuart um, Jeffries and Daisy Abbott or uh, Leah's work. Um, what Giannis, Giannis was doing towards the end here, and um, we, um, there were many, in many, many Katie Prices, and in many, many of the other presentations, there was lots of really good underlying models. I think we need to, when we push people to see what they're going to find in, in the publication, we need to let them know that there they're going to find some models to allow them to go and s step up to the plate and really just get on with doing these kinds of evaluations and how to do it. That was a good comment. Before we do that, just a quick one to say, I'll come back to the sincerity and honesty thing, which I also thought I appreciated from all the speakers. I think nobody did this how wonderful we are kind of thing, but actually it was much more reflective, and I think that's a useful way forward. Um, just a very quick one to offer too for consideration. We're talking, um, I think, very appropriately about a forward and bringing together models from across the various papers and tremendous wealth and breadth and depth of contributions. But perhaps also it might be worth considering, would you do an afterward in a sense or to the future of offering every participant to very briefly write either perhaps what motivated them to come and the opportunity and what they felt they got out of it, but very short, and then doing some sort of collation or some sort of excerpt from those, which might not be so traditional or straightforwardly academic, but it might in fact be quite uh, thought-provoking and give some very good pointers. Thank you so much for this, because of course I forgot if anybody, any of you had the chance to look at this, the, broad, the first question in our evaluation questionnaire, where would we be a conference on evaluating if we didn't have one? What brought you here? What is your interest in the topic? And I know I'm very conscious they are only on paper. I debated with Rosie online like 2 a.m. or something. It was just too much to do. We were very aware it should have been digital as well. I think the face-to-face -face is very important. So there is a plea. <laughs> There was also not quite voting for best paper, but it's something like which individual poster or paper did you find the most useful and engaging? Do you have any other comments or feedbacks? We tried, I'm not so sure we succeeded, to do brief and easy, so smiley faces, unsmiley faces, so you can tick, tick, tick quickly, as well as have a little bit of space for more reflective if you feel so inclined. So I hold, you know, being very conscious of what I've left behind, our normal jobs to do this on top. I cannot promise it before Christmas, but we'll try maybe to also, this was a really nice suggestion because the paper came, okay, there are quite a lot of us, and unlike the workshops, maybe combination. So a plea for all of you, we've got this lovely paper, uh, this lovely box on your way out on the registration box, to take a few minutes to put down your thoughts. Some of you didn't like kind of being named and shamed in this open discussion, but I'm sure more of you had things to say from your own experience. So it will be really useful, you can put it down, and I will try to also do a follow-up. Eventbrite, as you all know, played that really badly with all the thousands of waiting lists, but uh, there's a way that we have your emails from all of you, uh, and we, we might follow up, and I'll try to not flood you with questionnaires, but thanks for reminding me about this.
And unless there was any other comment or suggestion, I'm very conscious of the fact uh, it's two very long days, especially during the reception at the back yesterday. Um, I'll just, I wanted to finish with some thanks and just to honestly share yesterday uh, in the evening, maybe the two glasses of Prosecco helped, but I felt so good that I think this is the kind of thing that Kelvin Hall was about and generally why we do this job and why I, in my professional career at least, always was a little bit of a go-betweener, doing the cultural heritage, <laughs> academia, from one to the other, together usually most of the time. And um, it was so nice to have the vibe and the communication and the kind of ethos um, of conversation here that I hope we will find a forum to continue in some form. People kept saying Maria's conference and Maria will do this, but actually I'm, 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 I hope it's very clear there's no way I could have pulled this together on my own. I don't know if you've noticed, for those of you who weren't doing papers, the others definitely noticed, there was a very long list of members in the program committee, they're all on our website, that for example, my chairs and the absent and present ones, all the abstracts that were submitted to the call of papers went to at least three reviewers at very busy times, and I was so grateful for their comments. It was really useful and it was very open and transparent as well. Too much, I think, at some times, too sincere. I forgot to kind of hide from one to the other, and because some of the people were also submitting papers, of course, they were not allowed to review their own paper. They were seeing before, you know, we're ready what others were saying. But I'm very keen, as you see, uh, you probably realize on transparency and sincerity. So to all my, I'll try to name them, though it's not fair because I'm sure I'll forget some. So Milena, Seamus and Lorna were part of the program committee. Fred Saunderson from the National Library of Scotland. Geoffrey Stewart from Glasgow School of Art. Um, Kevin Gosling from Collection Strass who wanted to come but who couldn't make it to Glasgow. All my colleagues, the other colleagues at Hattie apart from Lorna. Anne Gao who was having to write at the same time as coming here very in-depth evaluation of our teaching activity, all our teaching activity at Hattie, as well as thinking and coming and thinking about evaluation, doing it in practice. Ian Anderson was chairing the poster sessions. Ian Ruthven, Aretida Mala from Strathclyde. And I'm sure because <laughs> there were more, oh, Fred Trien from um, Leven, KU11 in Belgium who was a uh, Skype speaker because there was the air bombing in Belgium at our crowdsourcing um, workshop uh, a few weeks ago. So, and uh, Joanna Green from Hattie as well, that was very delighted to get all the book history and special collections kind of related papers because of her research and interest. Uh, our chief librarian at Glasgow University, um, Susan Asworth, our senior archivist, Moira Rankin, Leslie Richmond, whose retirement party we all have to go to, who was, uh, he's, she's working at the library and she's been a real asset. She's been an archivist for many years working with digital collections. And apologies to those I'm sure I'm forgetting, but apart from those, you've seen uh, different kinds of volunteers. Um, I don't think Rosie is in the room, but I feel really, really deeply obliged, oh, she is, to say my biggest thanks to her because I think while I was trying the whip and the reminder, she was always with a smile and a grace. I think you will agree, answering your emails and your requests and kind of struggling with all kinds of things. The money for a research assistant for the project that the Royal Society of Edinburgh gave us, and I feel I should thank them because all this wouldn't have happened without them, was very, very little for a research assistant. So I think uh, Rose's work and contribution to the symposium probably ran out like half a year ago, and she's probably, strictly speaking, unpaid for everything she's been doing, apart from being a doctor, Rosie Spooner, Spooner, for quite some time now, and also having to work and teach at the Glasgow School of Art, as well as doing the symposium the last few days. So a real big thanks for her, and I want to ask you to join me in, in doing that. but also Maria Simu, who's now a colleague at the Hunterian, who went away, left her duties. Very, it's only, she's only two weeks in the job to come, come down and help us here. Lynn Freshuren, Anne Ross, Leanne Todd, who are student volunteers also helping out way past the teaching kind of term has finished and contributing to this and helping with some of the roving microphones and your requests at the front of the registration desk. The technical team that I, 
I think was quite a bit of a challenge. I've learned in Glasgow, I don't know if your institutions are indifferent, there used to be one team dealing with everything audiovisual and to support us. It's now a typical kind of university. They've restructured three different ones. So the video conferencing people are somewhere else. The media units doing the teaching support are somewhere else. And it's somewhere else yet again if you want to have the central computing services. But they managed to kind of go beyond institutional binders and really help us throughout those days. So great help to them. And um, I wanted to finish by thanking all of you for making it a really truly interactive and lively set of two days that definitely was a big lesson with lots of things for me to take away. So thank you everybody very much.